Hello and welcome to Scott Tilly Photography and what is the second wildlife video on the channel. Now the first video, which there'll be a link up there to, which you may want to look at first, looked at taking images of birds in your garden. Now the reason I chose that is because when you're starting out in wildlife photography it can be quite daunting and what you really want to do is get some nice images and get some confidence really and that enables you to do that because in your garden what you do have is you have most of the control you can control you know the food supply the perches where you're going to shoot the birds from what food you're going to put out for the birds to bring them in etc so it allows you to control all of that now it can be quite daunting to move away from that where you have less and less control so what I've done this week I've looked at what heart what I did when I took that progression that next step and I think for me the easiest way to do it is to look at your local area so that may be like me it's a woodland I've chosen here that I've been coming to for 15 years but it could be it could be grassland it could be farmland it could be pasture land it could be um, you know a river it could be lakes areas around the lakes anything like that local to you the reason I've chosen that is because the, the important bit is the local it means that you've got a lot of access to it it's really important that you try and spend as much time in that area as you can and the reason I say that is because the more time you spend in it the more time you will have to observe things and notice things that will help you take images not only in that area but will also then when you move to another area you'll go ah I've seen that where I live I know what that is you see so you can transfer those skills across but it's the time really you've got the time to spend in that one area which is what you need so anyway that's what we're going to do today I've chosen a local woodland I've been coming to for 15 years I'm going to show you some of the field craft that I use we'll look at some of the equipment we'll look at some of the research that you might need to do we'll look at some of the field signs and then what I'll try and do is get some images and video from this site now what I will say is, <coughs> from excuse me, from experience, I can probably say right now that it's going to take me four visits to get the video and stills from this from this site that I need to put on this video, so that you've actually got something to look at. And that's simply because it doesn't matter all the preparation you put in. Um, it's always down to whether the animals turn up and you know that that's the problem that's the thing that you can't control so I'm telling you now it's going to probably going to take me four attempts now that's an important lesson for yourselves as well when you start out doing wildlife photography and you move away from your back garden is the fact that you're going to have to have perseverance you're going to have to realize that some days you're going to come back with absolutely nothing and that's fine because you what you'll be doing is you'll be learning you know you'll be taking on new skills and it, it, it all adds up all that time you spend out there to improve the images that you get in the end so anyway I'll um, have a walk into the woodland we'll see what we can find and uh, we'll take it from there <music> Now that I've got myself down into the wood, I suppose one of the things that you're looking to consider when you're doing wildlife photography is the clothing that you wear. Now I think some people have got the impression that you know you have to have special kit with you know bits of tree leaf and all sorts hanging off it. That's not really the case. I mean I generally go out like this, which all I'm really looking for is clothing that's comfortable and it's in drab colours if you like so colours that will match the environment that I'm in and generally in the UK you know woodland or in um, pasture land or whatever you, this, these types of greens and greys and blacks are the colours that you're looking for one of the things I do like to do is wear gloves 
either fingerless like this, these or gloves that are full fingered but I can still use the camera. That's simply to cover up my fingers because obviously they're something that stands out to animals from quite a distance away. Um, so that you, you really want to try and cover those up because in that position there's not really a lot to see. So that's one thing that you can do. But you don't have to have special clothing. Um, the other thing that you need to consider when looking at clothing is the type of clothing and the materials that you use can affect the noise that the clothing will make. So, you know, an extreme example is if you put waterproof trousers on, they generally will make quite a lot of noise when you're moving, which is what you don't want. So look for materials that, you know, when you move, they don't really make a lot of noise. And uh, again, just build up that kit as you go along. Now, the other things that you might need to look at is equipment that you're going to use. Now, generally what I use, and I'll bring these in at the minute. These are two. Yeah, these are two things that I use quite a lot. One is a bean bag. And what I do with this... I mean, generally when I'm out doing wildlife, I want to carry as little as possible. So often I don't carry a camera bag. I'll just carry my camera with the big lens on and I'll sling this over my back like that. And then if I do come across something, it's easy to take that off, get down on the ground and get the camera on top of this as a support. But it also, again, you can get behind that. So your, a lot of your body will be hidden behind that, that, that bean bag as well which also helps um, so yeah I'll carry that with me something I also sometimes carry is I mean it's only really cheap scrim netting so anything that like this that you can use to sort of make a temporary cover for yourself so it might be that you know you walk into a woodland and you see some deer and they're walking across a field and you know where they're heading towards so it may be that you can get in front of them on the other side of the wood come out on the edge of the wood they're walking towards basically set this up quite quickly and cover yourself and obviously get some images as the, um, the deer are coming towards you right one of the things that you're going to need to consider when you're doing wildlife photography is how you move around in an area so that you don't scatter all the wildlife. Now I've said earlier in this video that you need to choose um, a location that's local to you so you can spend as much time in it as possible so that you can learn the wildlife that's there potentially where it is when it is all those sort of things. Now the first thing I consider when coming to one of my sites like this woodland that um, we're in today is the wind direction. Now there are various points in this woodland where you can actually park your car and you can actually access the site. What I'll do in the morning before I come to a site like this, I'll look on the map and um, on the weather and see, have a look at the wind direction specifically for this exact location. And then I will then enter the woodland at a position that is most advantageous for taking images of wildlife. So for instance, if the wind's coming from the southeast, I will try and choose um, to come into the wood from the northwest what that means is I'm going to have the wind in my face for the majority of the time coming through the wood now that's particularly important for things like mammals because if you do that the other way around if you enter the wood in the southeast with the wind behind you anything particularly things like foxes will smell you long before you see them or they even see you so you know by doing that that's a tick in the box to say right that's one thing that I can do to try and get, and get um, into a position to get decent images of wildlife. Right, once you enter the, the woodland or whichever area you've chosen, it's very important if you're going to actually see any wildlife and take any images of wildlife that you regulate how you move. Now what I mean by that is if you walk through a woodland as if you walk in the dog, um, you will generally make more noise than you're even actually aware of so for instance things like um, at certain times of year if acorns are on the floor and you stand on those they go off like a pistol shot and I mean I could probably demonstrate that now if you stand on that 
and this this isn't even dry if you get a dry one and stand on it it does make a hell of a noise which is what you want to avoid so what you need to do it might sound simple and you know a bit like well that's obvious but walking through the woodland is a combination of watching where you're putting your feet so walking around things like that but also you've got to temper that with the fact that you're actually looking for wildlife there's no point walking around with your head down looking at your feet all the time because you don't know what you're missing and everything doesn't walk on the track that you're walking on it can be coming through the woodland at the side of you so it's important that you develop your own pace that you're comfortable with where you can spend enough time making sure that you're not making a noise how you're walking but also temper that with looking round and looking for the actual wildlife and I find I'm probably walking probably 25% of the speed that I'd normally walk doesn't matter you know you're not there to walk a circuit of a woodland get as many miles in as you can you're there to try and photograph the wildlife so if you only walk half a mile in a whole day it's not really a problem you know because that's not the objective is to walk a certain route it's to to get images of wildlife and to do that you're going to have to slow right down and again the the terrain that you're walking on will change the pace that you need to walk the surface that you're walking on a lot of the paths around here um, what they've done in in places they've obviously been boggy at one time so they've come in with with um, trailers or whatever and tipped a load of hardcore um, now I found in the past that once you start walking on that the rocks grind together and they do make a noise trust me they do now what I tend to do then if I've got a gravelly path I'll walk on the edge where it's probably moss, more mossy and mossed over the advantage that gives you as well um, when we're talking about walking on paths if you've got a thin path obviously you can only walk down the path but a lot of the paths here are sort of eight foot wide um, because they have vehicles coming down it's a wildlife trust site so you have bird ringers and stuff using it and they'll drive the cars down now I tend to try and walk on the edge of the path that's simply because if something comes out of the wood and out of the woodland and onto the path the first thing it's going to do is look round now if I am in the middle of the path I have got virtually no chance of getting out of sight without making a massive movement that it'll see and it'll be off so by walking on the edge of the path I can often just one half a step and I've got at least some vegetation in front of me which will afford me enough um, time if I'm dressed like this to sort of slip into the side so that whatever's walked out won't focus on me and see me so that's it's a skill that you'll develop over time and you have to change it depending on the terrain that you're on but it will help you get closer to that wildlife the other thing that I would say and I think there'll be some image, some footage and some images coming up now this is a shot I took um, and footage I took earlier I think probably May this year and I was actually out doing some landscape photography but what I tend to do because I do a lot of wildlife is when I'm coming to and from where I've been doing the landscape photography I generally have my wildlife lens on the camera because it's those instances where something you know turns up and you haven't got the, there's no point having it in your camera bag because by the time you've got it out it'll it'll be gone and, gen and what I've done on this occasion is I've come to a junction now uh, one of the important things when you come to woodland pathways and junctions in paths is to always not just walk straight out into it and on this occasion I hadn't what I did is I walked to this t-junction and I just quietly sort of looked left and looked right and when I looked to the left I could see about 500 meters away there was a, a roe deer male and he was sort of fighting with the hedge and um, then eating a bit of stuff and then wandering from one side to the other so I quietly went back into the path that I was on got the bean bag lay on the floor and crawled around and I spent about 30 minutes and and the, the deer got that close in the end that the 400 mil was you know I was having to wind it in uh, he's nearly stood on top of me you could obviously you can see in his face you can see that there's something there but because I'm laid on the floor he doesn't associate it with it being a human so he was quite happy although a little bit curious to come closer and closer so by doing that you can 
as I say, if I'd have walked straight out into that path, stood up, he would have just gone. So one of the things that I would advise you doing is never walk straight out into a path. It does look a bit strange to everybody else, uh, which is probably why I try and do a lot of this stuff on my own, but uh, it, honestly, um, you don't know what's on that, the paths on the other side coming towards you and um, if there's a potential shot there then obviously you know you want to you want to take that chance now as I said previously you need to try and spend as much time as you can in your chosen area and um, over that period of time you will notice not only animals but also animal signs so um, and it's important to, when you go out and you think, you know, a day's been a waste of time because you've not taken any images, you can always use that as experience and gaining experience that will help you in the future. So what I tend to do is all the time I'm looking around for animals, I'm also looking for signs of animals. Now that can either be feces, you can find, um, you know, things like owl pellets, or you can find fox or stoat poo, which if you're looking books, it looks a certain type, a lot of the time there will be fur and bones in it and it will have a twist on the end. Foxes and, and stoats also tend to tr do it in prominent places, so if you've got a, a tree laid down or an old tree stump you often find it on there because they're marking the territory. Um, other things that you can look for is obviously animal tracks, so footprints and there are books that you can get that will show you, you know, what different footprints look like and I would recommend that you get one of those. Um, in in the UK the main deer that we have are roe and uh, muntjac that I get around here. Now muntjac are just a smaller version of roe deer footprints but what you'll also see is um, you see tracks that nothing else but a small deer could come through. Muntjac are quite small and you'll often see through the undergrowth you'll see like an oval shape um, and that is generally where a muntjac's come through the undergrowth and if you if you see the footprints as well then you can put the two and two together and know that you've got muntjac in that area so it's all things like that that you need to look for and that will help you build up a picture of what animals there are in that woodland and then you can do further research so say you think yeah that, that's a muntjac footprint now why is it there what is it potentially feeding on something now you may go and look at a book on on mammals look up the muntjac and it might say yeah these are the types of food it likes and you might look in that area and say lo and behold there's some of those trees there at this time of year it must be feeding on that so then you can potentially go back put a little hide up while it's still dark or whatever and you know in a in a position that's downwind of, of where this area is and potentially you'll get the muntjac coming through there so it's coupling all that sort of practical stuff that you can do out in the woodland with actual research in books and guides and there's loads of them out there I mean I, I use the Collins um, guides quite a lot especially for mammals that's quite a good one so yeah that's how you do it it's a it's a combination of, of time and um, practical things that you can see out in the woodland or whichever area that you've chosen and also then doing a little bit of research in books etc. Right, I didn't think it was appropriate to do a vlog on wildlife photography without touching a little bit on the ethics of wildlife photography. Now for me my best images have come they've been the most fulfilling when I've taken a picture of an animal and it's not even known I've been there you know that happens very rarely it's just walked off on its merry way and I've got that shot that I wanted often you know the, the shutter on the camera will tick an animal off that you're there and sometimes that's required because you get that look towards the camera but I'm more than that I don't really want you know I don't want animals tearing off you know absolutely petrified or you know I don't want to be running around after animals that's not that's not what I'm about as a wildlife photographer. As a wildlife photographer, I want to document wildlife doing what it does naturally and, you know, happy in its environment. Now, wildlife's under enough stress as it is at the minute due to losing its habitat and just generally the way that we treat wildlife. Um, there are some people in society who think it's, it's okay to sort of use wildlife as a plaything and um, kill it and maim it and tear it apart, you know, as they see fit. 
I obviously don't subscribe to that uh, mentality I think there's something wrong with people who, who do but I'm, I'm not going to sort of go into any any more of that on this channel at the, at, at the moment maybe it's something I'll address later but yeah so ethics wise just do as little as you as you can to disturb the wildlife and the wildlife must always their welfare must always be the first thing in your mind and if if take getting a shot is going to mean that you're going to cause unnecessary stress to that wildlife it's not worth taking it right i think that's probably a good point to call it a day for this video i hope you've enjoyed it this was the second of uh, my videos on wildlife photography and it's hopefully got you to a point to actually get out into the, the actually the the wild areas that are around where you live I mean there are plenty and to be fair you know once you get into there you could spend the rest of your life just in that area you'll never know it you know as well as you think you do there's always stuff that comes up to surprise you so I hope you you know you're gonna get out into the environment and do some wildlife photography now I understand obviously from the two videos I've covered a lot of areas now next year I'll be doing more species specific videos so if you want to see those then obviously subscribe to the channel and click on the bell and then you'll be notified when they're, they're uploaded to the system on YouTube I also because there's a lot of information in these first two videos and if you're just starting on wildlife photography it can be a lot to take in so what I'm proposing to do is produce a fact sheet and cover all the stuff I've covered in the first two videos plus the stuff that I forgot to cover in the first two videos um, and that'll make a handy little reference guide for you now if you want that fact sheet then if you could subscribe to the channel for me and what I'm going to do I'm going to put my email address uh, in the description of the vi video below and then obviously if you email me and say subscribe to your channel please can you send me the fact sheet I will send you a copy of that fact sheet um, via email and you can print that off and have that with you and you know it'll pro provide hopefully a handy guide when you're actually out in the field taking some images anyway that's all I've got to say for this one I hope you have a good new year I'm certainly going to try and yeah I'm looking forward to doing those videos we're off up to sky uh, on the 4th of January I'm not sure what I'm doing up there. There is reports that we've got um, otters just below the cottage we're in. So maybe you'll get a video on otters. I'm not sure. I can't guarantee anything at the minute. <laughs> um, because um, obviously this time of year is quite difficult. And the days are quite short. Uh, so there might be, there'll definitely be some landscape images from up there. But there might be some wildlife as well. So anyway, hope to see you soon. Um, and yeah, please subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you for the next one. Mm -hmm.